Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petites and we are at a beautiful established pollinator garden just behind me. So we're gonna go over just what do you need for a pollinator habitat? And basically when you're attracting any type of wildlife, you're looking for food source. You definitely wanna provide them with a water source. You also wanna provide them with shelter or cover. And then kind of a fourth thing that you want to look for is an area where they can raise their young. And definitely a fifth thing that you want to provide are sustainable gardening practices. So basically trying to use, um, you know, trying to use cultural means, natural means of taking care of these plants. Um, you know, really using elbow grease, pulling weeds, not spraying herbicides, not spraying pesticides, really trying to take care of the garden naturally intended. Um, and also just taking care of your water resources, um, using compost, that type of thing uh, to feed your plant material. So those five things are really something that you should think about if you're um, wanting to start a pollinator garden. And I always say a sixth thing for pollinator gardens is diversity. You want to make sure that you have a huge assortment of different types of plant materials, um, shapes, colors, but especially seasons, that you have something for early season, mid season, and late season in our growing um, area because that will give you a long season of attraction to the pollinators. So that's great. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this garden I'm going to show you a couple different types of plants. I do want you to be aware that there's some annuals in this garden, so annual plant material that you would have to plant every year, um, and also perennial plant material that, of course, works great for us because it comes back in the garden three years or more. Um, and, and again, long bloomers. There's a ton of long bloomers behind me too, so that's always really helpful for the pollinators as well. So come on, let's take a look. So let's start here with maybe some of, um, I've talked about how attractive herbs are for pollinators. And I wanted to show you right here, we've got a really cool mint down below here. This is the calamint. This is kind of a, a newer plant that's coming in the perennial market. We're starting to see more of it, of it in a garden, but the calamints and the cat mints and um, the agasakis, I'll show you some of those. They're all a great family. Any of the mints are gonna work real well um, for a pollinator garden. Again, long blooming, great aroma, um, and also deer resistant. So that's always really great to have in your pollinator garden. And as you move back, you see daisies. Daisies are always gonna be a really nice um, kind of landing pad for pollinators, um, especially your butterflies, especially your bees, where they can just perch right on top of that flat flower. And that will work really, really well for them, especially when they can kind of take in more sunlight, dry off those wings, and of course, take advantage of all the pollen that's in the center. We have talked about single flowering varieties where you have a, a wide open yellow center or dark center in the Black Eyed Susans. And then you go ahead and you have those single flowers, lots of pollen in the center, lots of little flowers in the center of those daisies, and then the petals coming out. Um, yarrow in the back, awesome plant, um, absolutely wonderful. Again, kind of in that, that herb family, if you will, great flowering herb, lots of different uses to it, but again, excellent, excellent pollinator. As we walk through, we see Liatris. Liatris is those purple spiky plants right there in the back. Liatris is a great native. It usually comes in white or purple, um, so there's not a lot of color choice, but man, is it a great sort of late summer bloomer. Um, wonderful for attracting your, your hummingbirds, your butterflies, your bees. So that it's really a wonderful one. And then down below here, this is one of Angelo's favorite plants. This is Coreopsis. There's a couple of different varieties here. Some yellows, bicolors, even some dark orangey reds. They are a wonderful long blooming plant. Again, in that daisy family, so you're always going to have a lot of pollen, um, you know, available for the pollinators. But again, just repeat blooms all through the season, some starting uh, rather early at usually the end of May and can go really through August, September and take us into October um, as well. Lavender right across the front. There's actually some lavender, some thyme right across the front. And again, lavender's in your mint 
family. So uh, that all kind of plays a part where the herbs, the more herbs you have, the more flowering herbs you have, that's always going to be great for the pollinators. They're going to really enjoy that. As we keep going, um, I love the, the red hot pokers. Um, this is Nephophia and um, any color that you have, these are always gonna be great for the hummingbirds. But I also earlier, and I think he's, he's actually kind of stuck in these little tubes here, but there's some little sweat bees that are kind of going up those really, really small tubes. And um, his little bum is sticking out right now, but they are really all around the Nephophia right now. Then, and of course your sweat bees, your smaller bees are um, native bees. So that's always great to attract to the garden as well. So we keep going here. This is a lot of people's favorite annual um, out there in the garden, something for a taller height. This of course is Cosmos and Cosmos again, you know, being in um, the daisy family, having a lot of pollen um, here and then also quite a bit of nectar. So um, Cosmos, I'm gonna tell you folks, they are really easy to grow from seed and I would just direct sow them right into the garden. Once you get them established in the garden, sunny garden of course, but once you get them established, they kind of reseed themselves and continue to produce. So um, that first season, just go ahead and seed them, usually in May when we can get the soil prepared and ready to go. And then they'll just, they'll fill out after that. As we keep going, um, kind of in the background here, and Taylor will show you, there is an ornamental onion back there. And these are sort of a newer perennial plant. Um, this onion might be millennial. There, there's, there's a lot of different varieties. I shouldn't say a lot. There's a couple different varieties, but millennium is one of the ones that um, has really been a great producing plant for us. It's a shorter compact ornamental onion, but later blooming in the season. We see the big giant ornamental onions usually around May, um, sometimes into June, but these guys are kind of later bloomers, really nice and compact, but full of flowers. And onion family is fantastic for your pollinators as well. Of course, really good deer resistance too. Cone flowers, as you see, awesome native. And again, whenever you can incorporate native varieties, um, cultivated native varieties or native ours, that's always gonna be awesome for them. So I mentioned the Liatris, the Coreopsis is also a, a native variety or native um, cultivated variety. Cone flowers are going to be a native cultivated variety as well. Um, but there's lots to choose from, lots of different varieties and they all work wonderfully, especially for your birds. If you like to attract feathered friends into the garden, um, those seed cones, single seed cones are gonna be awesome to feed them, you know, going all the way through summer and into fall as well. I mentioned water. Water is always going to be a, really a key when you're attracting wildlife. And in this case with pollinators, they really like shallow bass. Okay, so shallow bird bass, a um, little bit of a fountain. There's a little solar fountain in there, a little bit of a bubbling um, or aerating or misting. It's always great. Hummingbirds love that. The bees will go to the side or the edge of the water. Uh, the butterflies will as well. Um, and also if you think about puddling too, so little small indentations in the soil, keeping those areas kind of wet or muddy, if you will. There's lots of amino acids, lots of salts that the pollinators need um, th that work very, very nicely. So think about puddling areas too in your garden. Ah, Cardinal lobelia, this is your cardinal flower, um, beautiful perennial plant. They really do appreciate kind of a moister area, but it's doing really lovely in this garden. And again, awesome native, of course, the red color. Anytime you see red in this garden, um, that's always gonna be really attractive to the hummingbirds, uh, of course. That's an absolute favorite. They do like the reds, their oranges, um, the best. Okay, we're gonna keep on going here. We have Gara. Gara is kind of a, if you will, midsummer to late summer and into fall. Really great bloomer out there. Um, sometimes we call it whirling butterflies because if the breeze catches these stems, the, the flowers will kind of shake or flutter on the stems and, and it is a great long bloomer. Usually comes in pink and white, um, so that's a great one. And then right here, I've got um, Monarda and it's just, it's not blooming right now. It looks like it has gotten cut back, 
a little bit, which is which is totally fine. But again, your Monarda or Bee Balm, awesome pollinator attractant, will will bring everything in hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. And um, again, member of the mint family, so you really can't go wrong there. Agastaki, these look like um, they've just kind of been newly planted or installed. But again, um, this is your false Aesop, mint family, very, very fragrant, wonderful colors, like a rainbow of colors. You can get yellows, pinks, reds, um, oranges. I will tell you, my favorites are really the blues, like Blue Fortune or Black Adder. Uh, the reason being is they are super hardy. They give you a lot of height in the garden. They are wonderful. These are very nice too, but they'll stay very compact. Okay, I have iris behind me, but I wanted to show you this. You see the foxglove back here? Foxglove are um, just a wonderful early bloomer. And when they are cut back, they will produce a lot of side shoot growth. So the foxglove is wonderful to have in this pollinator garden. And then behind it is gonna be your Asclepius tuberosa. And um, that is your butterfly weed, okay? And it's a little bit different from milkweed because it stays a little bit more compact and it has that orangey golden color to it. But if when Taylor gets close-ups of it, the honeybees are all over this thing. So really is an awesome, not only butterfly plant, but also for the, the honeybees especially, okay? Um, so all those plants do so well together. I wanted to point out that there are, is a very large milkweed in the background. Um, it's more of your standard pink uh, milkweed. Um, and so it is just showing pods. So we'll walk around the back and I'll show you the seed pods on that too. And then these beautiful upright vines, believe it or not, are an annual vine and they're called a uh, cardinal vine. They're in the morning glory family of the Ipomo Ipomeo family and they have these long red tubes on them, but you literally will put the seeds in the ground and have them fill out and grow every year. So they are an annual vine that you'll want to plant from seed. So that's a really cool one too. Um, I did wanna point out over here that there is a beautiful large crab apple. And for pollinators, the fruit trees are an excellent, excellent source of pollen, um, you know, nectar as well awesome awesome plant to have or awesome tree to have nearby a pollinator garden um, and, I, and again just a wonderful source and then um, i love that they've kind of hung some twig balls with some bedding uh, bird bedding of course so they can take out and pull that bedding out and then go ahead and make nests as well so again this habitat is uh, full of food great source of water awesome for you know cover especially with vines because all of those pollinators can kind of tuck stay underneath the vines and the trellises there um, but it is full of sustainable practices and i'm going to tell you they can they can raise their young use all the different bedding that they need um, in order to develop those nests um, one other thing and i was going to have taylor pan over you'll see and we're not going to get too close but they have very very active beehives over here so there's two very active and you can see all the honeybees kind of flying in and out and again if honeybees are one of the things that you want to kind of concentrate on um, it's great to have your beehives establish them there's plenty of bee societies that can help you out get started um, many of them will kind of mentor that program and and it'll be great if, if you have the space and it's something that you'd really like to do um, of course your honeybees are social they are non-native bees so that's why they need a little bit more care um, than your native types like a bumblebee for example but um, great great hobby to get into okay Taylor we're gonna come around back here and um, watch your step and We've got, we're gonna give you a close up if you can get closer to the um, butterfly weed here. Look at the honeybees. Okay. I probably just scared them all. 
but they're all over that plant. And then we've got some Russian sage for late color. It's just starting to come out and, and fill out as far as that beautiful blue color. And again, in the mint family. So any of your sages are in the mint family. They do really nicely. And then I'm gonna show you on the back of the cardinal flower vine. Whoop. See them? So it's a great hummingbird plant. But again, just an annual. So you wanna make sure that you're planting these seeds. You can either start them indoors in the winter and plant them out in the spring, or you can direct sow them into the ground. And then I thought this was a great idea. So this gardener, um, with your vines, they always have kind of bare knees. So what she did is she actually planted this beautiful kufia down here. That's um, Mexican heather. There's lots of different varieties. This is a red and purple variety, but there's um, like firecracker kufia, which is kind of an orangey red tube, um, but really pretty down at the base, just to kind of cover up those bare knees on the vine. And then let's walk over here. I wanted to show you the milkweed and the milkweed pods. And so, your typical milkweeds are gonna have this pink flower to them, okay? And then when they start to fill out those beautiful long seed pods. And so you can let them stay on the plant dry and then actually you can um, collect these seeds. And what I would usually do is I would collect half the seeds and go ahead and sow them in the fall and collect half the seeds, save them and then sow them in the spring, okay? So they always produce a ton of seed, um, so do be aware of that. And the, the milkweed, um, probably we won't see seeds until about September around here. Now, there was a caterpillar <laughs> on one of these plants, and I kind of lost it, but they have been collecting caterpillars and developing the monarchs so that they can release the monarchs um, out full force into the garden. So that's kind of a neat, uh, you know, little hobby to do too. But look at this. I missed this one, Taylor. Um, Crocosmia, beautiful red. Um, again, this is more of like a bulb, if you will, bulb type plant, but they will come back year after year in the garden. And that's a great hummingbird plant. Okay. Let me finish up on this side and we've kind of taken a full circle around the garden, but I did want to show you that I think, you know, your pollinator garden isn't complete without a butterfly bush or buddleia. And um, any color, any size, any shape that you like, they're always awesome for your pollinators. Um, yes, known as attracting butterflies, but again, these guys are such long bloomers that um, really in so many new varieties out there, really great varieties, that they will attract pollinators for a very long time in your garden all the way into the fall. And again, that's key to keep up your diversity and of course, keep your garden blooming all through the seasons. Enjoy.